Hello class and welcome to our presentation on Introduction to Contemporary Religious Studies. So in this course, we will rely primarily upon what is referred to as the academic approach to the study of religion. And what this means ultimately is that we will rely heavily upon the peer-reviewed works of religious studies scholars in our endeavor to understand diverse religious belief systems. Now, this is not to say that we are not going to study the, um, the views of religious devotees as well, but we are going to have a healthy balance with a study of religious studies scholarship. Now, what exactly is this academic approach known as religious studies? How do religious studies scholars approach the study of religion? And when did the religious studies movement begin? So contemporary religious studies is an academic discipline which began as an intellectual movement in 19th century Europe, predominantly in Germany, France, England, and Northern Europe. And it emphasizes the comprehensive study of religion or the total study of religion, meaning that religious studies scholars will study a religion's historical development, any sacred languages associated with their sacred texts, their rituals, their theology and philosophy, as well as any cultural and artistic expressions. Now, the founder of the modern movement of contemporary religious studies is Friedrich Max Mueller. And in 1895, Mueller announced the need for a scientific study of religion, meaning a discipline dedicated to objectivity and the use of empirical evidence in analyzing religious texts and phenomenon. Now, what do we mean by objectivity and empirical evidence in the study of religion? Well, we'll talk about that in a moment. So following in Mueller's footsteps, there are three words which define contemporary religious studies, objectivity, empirical evidence, and skepticism. So what is objectivity? Well, objectivity refers to being religiously neutral. And in this discipline, a religious study scholar is ideally religiously neutral, meaning that he or she does not allow personal religious or non-religious beliefs to affect research or writing. So according to this approach, to create academic work without personal bias will result in a more accurate depiction of a religion and the corresponding issues that are raised. So for example, if a Catholic scholar is studying the role of jihad during the Crusades, he or she should not allow his or her personal religious beliefs and possibly biased views toward Islam to affect the results of his or her study. Rather, she should fairly evaluate the historical significance of the Crusades, taking into consideration the contributions of both sides of the conflict, Catholics and Muslims. Secondly, religious studies scholars should uh, rely upon empirical evidence in their study. So a religious studies scholar should use what is called material evidence when studying a religion's historical development, as well as religious behavior or phenomenon. That is, a scholar should use uh, material evidence like archaeological evidence, existing sacred texts, as well as the observation and interviewing of religious individuals when composing an argument about religion. So for example, let's say that an academic uh, is studying Native American ritual dances. So an academic arguing that Native American ritual dances inspire certain natural processes such as rain must provide evidence to support his or her position. He or she cannot defend a claim based on visions, dreams, feelings, or just because he or she thinks so. Rather, again, his or her arguments should be based upon solid empirical evidence. For example, sacred texts, historic records, interviews, etc. So again, a religious studies scholar cannot base their conclusions upon pure theorizing. They actually have to base it on material evidence. And thirdly, religious studies scholars are encouraged to uh, approach religions with a bit of skepticism. So as a result of emphasis upon empirical evidence, academics are often skeptical about supernatural events. They're, they're kind of suspicious or they call these events into doubt. So generally speaking, religious studies scholars interpret such phenomenon, that is supernatural phenomenon, as metaphorical expressions of religious ideas. So for example, 
An academic studying the Prophet Muhammad's night journey, an event in which the Prophet visited Allah in heaven, might explain that the occurrence may not be an actual historical event to be taken literally, but rather the author of the account in the Hadith may have used the story to explain a spiritual idea, perhaps to reveal that the Prophet had a close relationship with God. Thus, a scholar should neither support nor dispel the possibility of supernatural events. Such supernatural events could have occurred, but we should weigh such events with some skepticism. So in this course, we're going to be reading a lot about supernatural events in these religious belief systems. And uh, what we're going to be asked to do, all of us, uh, is to have a little bit of skepticism when it comes to studying these events. Now, in a contemporary religious studies department, there are many different branches of study. So, for example, some scholars might focus more on theology or the philosophy of religion, others on the psychology or anthropology of religion. Some may focus upon textual studies and linguistics, whereas others might focus primarily upon comparative religion, which is uh, the exercise of comparing the global religious traditions. And this is what we are going to be primarily focusing on, uh, the subfield of comparative religion. Now, there are two goals of comparative religion. One, in this class, we are going to study each religion as a unique form of expression so as to appreciate its historical, cultural, and theological complexity. But also in this class, we are going to compare religious themes in order to identify key similarities and differences. So yes, we will study each religion and appreciate it on its own, but we will also do some comparative work. And lastly, we will study the rich diversity and complexity of each religion in order to appreciate the variety of beliefs and practices contained within these faiths. But we shall simultaneously try to generalize the main message of each religion so to prevent us from becoming overwhelmed. So in other words, we will appreciate each religion's diversity and complexity, but we'll also try to boil these religions down to their kind of primary teachings. <laughs>